has been an awesome morning already, singing praises to God. His life for ours. Praise God for His love, His goodness, His grace that we celebrate this morning. Today is our last morning of our more than study. This is the culmination of everything we've been looking at of who Jesus is. My kids were talking yesterday, and I hear them often say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Piper asked Camden this question. And he was thinking of all the things that he might want to be when he grew up. And, and as he was thinking of his response, I was thinking back to my childhood and how I would have responded to that question of what do you want to be when you grow up? And my dream and vision was always to play in the NBA. That's what I wanted to do. That was my desire. And God never granted me any ability to play basketball very well. <laughs> but I wanted to be that guy on TV. I wanted, to be, I wanted to be the guy making the last second shot. I wanted to be famous. And I wanted people to see me. And as I, you grow older, I began to realize as I'm watching these men on TV that are fulfilling probably their dreams, that it wasn't quite everything they thought it would be. They were looking to something that they thought would fulfill their greatest and deepest desires that would fill the empty holes in their life. And they looked to other great players as well. And I, I think it's funny as you hear professional athletes today talk about professional athletes of the past and as they relate and they begin to realize, oh wait, that guy wasn't as great as I thought he was. He's got some flaws. And I don't think I liked him as much as I thought I did when I was a kid. See, when we place our hope in men, we will be let down every time. And our study this morning, our final more than study, is we are going to see that Jesus is more than us. Now, don't think of that title and be like, oh, that's discouraging. I, I feel worthless. This title is not to make us feel worthless, that we are nothing, or to be discouraged it is to point us in the direction of where we are to find our worth. Where are we to be encouraged? And it is the person of Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, verse 22. We will see, we are introduced again to John the Baptist. He's been out of our chapters and our messages for a while, but in this one today, he's going to make a reappearance on the scene. In John chapter 3, verse 22, we're going to go down to verse 36. And it says, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized and John was also, or also was baptizing in Anan near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore, therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. 
He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the, not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not, the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the truths and the challenges and the application that you will reveal to us through the teaching of your spirit. God, I pray that our eyes and our hearts and our minds will be focused on you and your word today, God, that our, we would be open to being taught, that we would be open to being changed. God, as we look and as we see you in a greater way today than we have ever seen you before, as we lift you up and we praise you for you and you alone, God, are worthy, worthy of honor, worthy of praise, worthy of our lives. Oh, God, you are greater. You are more than we can imagine. God, we thank you for Christ. God, we thank you for the love, the hope, the peace, the joy, the comfort, the salvation, and the life that can only be found in him. Oh, God, we love you because you first loved us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, our setting, what is taking place? Look back in verse 22. We see that after the things that concluded with Nicodemus, Jesus is leaving Jerusalem and he's heading south to Judah. And his disciples are with him. And he, he tarries there and he's baptizing. And then in verse 20, 23, we see that John the Baptist is about 50 miles separated from Jesus. And he's baptizing as well. And it says in verse 23, there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. And then a dispute comes, two disputes that we're going to see, as Jesus is baptizing in one place, and John is baptizing in another. Verse 25, the first issue that arises, it says, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. So basically what is happening here is there are some Jews, some unbelievers that are trying to trip up the disciples of John the Baptist. They're trying to confuse and discredit what John is doing. So that's issue number one. We have unbelievers that are trying to discredit John the Baptist. In the next verse, we see another issue. John was facing opposition, and now in verse 26, John's own disciples begin questioning. They begin doubting. Look in verse 26. It says, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, the guy that you baptized, he, we, he was, that, we was, that was with us, look what he's doing. To whom thou bearest witness, to whom you were, you're talking about, to whoever you're pointing everybody to, it says, behold, now he's baptizing. And all men are going to him. We're losing our following. They're missing the point of John's entire message. They're missing the point of what John was trying to show all people. 
that he was pointing them to Jesus. And the fact that all men are leaving John the Baptist and they're going to follow Jesus was what he was trying to accomplish all along. But his disciples, who were right there with him, missed it. They were confused. They had questions and they doubted his message. And obviously, this is also fascinating because they're about 50 miles apart. And news was traveling quick. Now, 50 miles in that day is not the same as 50 miles in this day. I mean, maybe you had a donkey or a camel. You go a little bit quicker. But imagine walking 50 miles and carrying this news. So it was a big event. It was newsworthy as it traveled from one place to another. So these two issues John is about to give a testimony to. All of the majority of the verses that we're going to look at this morning is John's response to these two issues. First, to the unbeliever, and secondly, to those that might be missing the message, that may be doubting, that may be confused. So this morning, if we find ourselves in one of those two places, maybe being confused about who God is, or maybe not even believing altogether. Look at these verses. In verse 27, he's about to lay some serious truth. He gives us 15 truths in the span of about six or seven verses. He's going to lay some deep theology on his disciples and the Jews about who he is and who Jesus is. He's going to say, wait, you're missing it. Let's go back to the beginning, and I'm going to tell you again. Look in verse 27. The first truth that he says, it's man's inability. John answered his disciples and the Jews, and he said, a man can receive nothing. Unless, where's the source of salvation? Look in the end of verse 27. Except it be given him from heaven. Salvation comes from God. John's going to say again in verse 28, who am I? I've told you again and again who I am and what my role is, but let me lay it out for you again. In verse 28 says, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ. He said, I told you before, I'm not Jesus. These people aren't just supposed to be following me. They're supposed to come through me to him. I'm directing them as I speak, and as they come to me, I'm directing them to Jesus because I am not Jesus. John knew who he was. He's telling them again his identity. And as we continue, he's saying now, this is my role. He said, but that I am sent before him. I have a purpose. I'm fulfilling my purpose. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to be more than what I am because there is fulfillment in my role in the purpose and plan of Jesus Christ. Then in his identity in verse 29, he says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. The bridegroom speaking of Jesus, the bride being the church. He's saying, I'm not, this is not my wedding. I'm not the guy getting married here. I'm the friend. I get to go to the wedding and I get to witness the groom and the bride be married. And I get to witness joy. And I get to witness unity. And I am happy and I'm content because I know who Jesus is and I know who I am. Verse 29 John's relationship to Jesus, as we just spoke about, he says, he says, I am but I am the friend, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth. And the proper response to Jesus getting the glory and the honor. It says in verse 29, it says, Rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore, therefore is fulfilled. All of those truths, those seven truths that we just looked at, lead up to this Christ-centeredness response that he is about to say. 
verse 30, he says, he must increase. He must be greater. But I must decrease. And this is his main argument. He's saying it's okay that God is getting the glory, that people are going to Jesus, because that's the point of all of this. That is the point of our lives. Not for somebody to pat us on the back for doing our job, but us to rejoice when people go to Jesus. He's saying he must increase, but I must decrease. I am wanting Jesus to be lifted up, he says. This is a great thing that is happening. And then he goes into speaking some more truths. He goes to Jesus, his origin. In verse 31 it says, he that cometh from above. He said Jesus is not from this earth like we are. He is greater He is more than us. He is not like us. And then it says, He is above all. In verse 31, look at the end of verse 31. He says it again. It says, He that cometh from heaven is above all. As He's speaking to the Jews, as He's speaking to His disciples, He's refocusing them on who Jesus is. He's saying he's greater than us. He's not like us. He's not from this earth. He's from above. And he is above all. So we should not be discouraged, he's saying to his disciples, that these people are flocking to him. He goes on. He speaks of his origin again, of our origin again, in the middle of verse 31. He says, he that is of the earth is earthly. We are from this earth. And they speaketh of the earth. And what he hath seen and heard, in verse 32, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He's saying there's going to be few that will believe Of the population of this earth, how many confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? In comparison, it's not many. And that is what he was saying. In the essence of faith, in verse 33, he's saying, And he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. He says, anyone who accepts Jesus' testimony affirms that he is true true. John just said a lot right there. We could take each one of these points and build a message around it. Deep theology of refocusing his disciples on Jesus. Pointing his, to his disciples to the fact that Jesus is more than us. He is above all. He is greater And he will not fail you. Pride comes from thinking of ourselves more highly than we should. John knew his purpose. He knew his role was to prepare the way for Jesus. And when God started getting all the glory, he was not jealous. He rejoiced. He rejoiced. John knew whatever he received, all the good in him came from above. All the good that is in us comes from Jesus because he and he alone is good. John, the author of the gospel, picks up in verse 34. He was sharing John the Baptist's testimony as he writes the gospel. He's carrying this momentum on of this incredible testimony that we just heard. And in verse 34, John the evangelist now speaking, keeps the theme of Jesus going. 
He says, for he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. God is giving him the full spirit, the full power, the full glory. Verse 35, the father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. We see an echo of a, of a previous verse. Look back to John 3, verse 16. I think we may be familiar with that verse a little bit. We see an echo of verse 35. The Father loved the Son and gave all things into His hand. And in verse 16, we see it says, For God so loved, what? The world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes, believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. God loved his son and gave him all things. God loved the world and gave them his son. Verse 17 of John chapter 3, for God sent his son, not, not, sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's motivation is not condemnation. It is salvation. Condemnation or his wrath, as we see, comes from rejecting Jesus. Verse 18 Two choices that we're faced with, choosing our way or choosing his way. Verse 18, we have seen that God loves the son and gave him all things. So what, what's at stake in our response to him? Salvation and life are what are at stake verse 18, it says that he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that be- But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Now jump into verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So two choices, our way or his way. We choose us, we choose death. We choose him, we choose life. Because he is more than us. His way is greater. One reason we often struggle with humility is because we struggle with seeing God for who he is. When we see God for who he is, the creator and the sustainer of life, as one who is more than us, it brings us into the position of submissiveness. It brings us to our knees. It drives us to worship because we see His greatness. He must increase. It's letting Him be seen through us. So when people look at us, they don't see Jonathan, they see Jesus. They don't see my words, they don't see my actions, they don't see my love, they see the words, the actions, and the love of Jesus. He must increase through us. He must be seen through us. Not my desires, not what I want to be when I grow up. That he is seen through my life. That I show others that he and he alone is worthy because he is more than I am. And that's okay. Because if I want true worth in this life, I must choose Jesus. 
I will not find worth in myself. There is no self-esteem because this self is condemned in dying and going to hell. The only esteem I can find in this life is in the person of Jesus Christ because he is more than I am. So in this passion, this passage, who do we identify with? We've seen a, a few characters. The first character that we have seen were the unbelieving Jews who are challenging and trying to discredit Jesus, or John the Baptist, excuse me. So if you find yourself in that position... <laughs> Where you do not believe, what then is the response that you must do? We saw it in John 3.16. Look back there. If you do not believe, today is the day of salvation. Choose Jesus today. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our way is no way. Jesus is the only way. Choose Jesus today. Believe. Maybe you're like John the Baptist's disciples. And, you, and things aren't clicking quite right in your minds. Maybe you're confused, maybe you have doubts, maybe you're struggling with the message. Maybe the difficulties of life are causing us to pause and question who God is. Turn with me to Romans 8, verse 28. If that is you, I have a verse for you. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible One that helps me when I'm struggling with difficulties of life, trying to figure out why things are happening in my life. Romans 8, 28. And it says, and we know that some things work together for good. No? Oh, let me try again. And we know the things that bring us pleasure work together for good. No? Help me this time. And we know that all things, not just some things, not just the good times in life, all things work together for good. Why? Because God is good. And he is using Every pain, every difficulty, every time of joy, every time of tears and sorrow, he is using all of those things not to hurt you, not to cause you doubt, but he is using them for your good. And so then when we experience the difficulties and the struggles. We can face them with a different perspective. Because we know, okay, this is hard. (laughs) I don't want to do this. But I know that God's using it for good. And so my perspective in my life struggle, whatever it is for you, is okay, this is hard. (laughs) I don't understand it. I want it to be over. I can't take another moment, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to hold firm and I'm not going to doubt God because I know all things work together for good. But not for everybody. Look at the conditions that follow. Wait a minute. <laughs> You just said they do, but for who? To them that love God. 
to them who are called, who are the called according to his purpose. God is working all things for your good if you believe, if you love, if you trust. For the unbeliever who is going through the difficulties of life, there is not good working for you. For the believer in your struggles and the difficulty of life, God is working together for good. Revelation chapter 5. Turn with me there. Revelation chapter 5. The same author of the Gospel of John now writes in Revelation, in the end, as God has given him vision to see We see a similar theme that John is trying to get across, that he tried to get across before, that Jesus is greater than us, that Jesus is above all, that Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, John speaking, he says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So no man in heaven could open it, could look on it. And his response in verse 4, John, he said, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Oh, but there was hope. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him and sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and the twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. God, Jesus Christ, has redeemed us through the shedding of His blood Only him and him alone is worthy. We continue. In verse 10, it said, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength 
and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto them that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. What an incredible image of worship that only belongs to Jesus. Him and Him alone is worthy. He is more than us. He is greater than us. And again, that is not to bring us down or make us feel like we are nothing. No, it is to show us the direction of where to find worth in this life. And I was, as I was reading through Revelation 5 this week, I was reminded, it says they sing a new song. And I remembered that somebody had written in the last couple of years a song about Revelation chapter 5. And so I want us to listen to that. And I want you to reflect on where we are with Jesus. Are you the unbelieving Jew, the doubting disciple, or are you like John the Baptist, ready to say, right now, in this moment, he must increase, I must decrease, because he and he alone is worthy. If we could play that, please. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all?
Father God, oh God, we love you. Only Jesus is worthy. Lord, if there is a life here today that has never believed, has never accepted and placed their trust in Christ, that has never made that proclamation that he is worthy, God, that they would make that right today for the struggling believer trying to see if they can, if, are the promises true? I can't see it through my difficulty. Oh, yes. They are true. And God is good. And he is worthy. Oh, Lord. We thank you for your love. God, work in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. We're going to take a moment of silence to reflect. And if any decisions need to be made, make them now. Do not wait a second longer. If you need to believe, believe. If you need to be shown the way, we will show you the way. If you need to take a, take a step of faith, unite with this church as a member. Follow Jesus in baptism. Or maybe it's just to give all of our burdens back to him. Whatever it is that we need to deal with today in this moment of silence, with heads bowed and eyes closed as we pray, that in this moment, we will let God speak to us. Oh, God, you are worthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your love for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.